Greetings, everyone. We are back with another market commentary. I hope everyone is having a great summer. I am recording this video on Tuesday, July 26th. So I know there's a lot going on this week with the Fed and earnings. Most of you will watch this on Sunday or Monday of what's the date there, the 31st or the 1st. So if something's a little lagging or outdated by the time of this recording, no, that's, that's why. So many exciting topics today. We've had a little rally off the June lows. Uh, I've got a hodgepodge of stuff, economic data, what the Fed is saying versus what the market is pricing in. As I mentioned, it's earnings week and we're going to cover a wide range of topics. So with that said, let me share my screen and we will get into this video. Okay. So this is just a little snapshot of the S and P 500, where we've been since the middle of last summer. So about a year. And I mentioned the rally off June lows here. We had a little bounce, kind of bounced around and then this little leg higher. So I believe we're up well, not after today, again, today's Tuesday. So roughly six to 7% off the lows, not a, a hugely meaningful upswing, but it's nice to get some green here on the, the chart, as opposed to a lot of these nasty red candles. So the question everyone is asking is this, does this period in June mark the bottom or is this just a bear market rally? And it's impossible to say, you know, I've written a lot about the, the futility of trying to time a bottom and bear, bear market rallies are pump fakes. I mean, they're, they're essentially rallies that people feel good about, but having a rally in the context of a broader market decline is actually quite common. So what I did here was just look at a couple market cycles, one from the tech bubble back in the early 2000s and another from uh, the peak of the financial crisis, right? The market peak and the market trough. And you can see all of these green outlines here mark a bear market rally, right? So you see a bottom here, not a bottom, but you see a trough here. And then this green indicates a bear market rally. But if you, if you zoom out and look at the entire context, this is a declining market, obviously, but within this, there's probably a dozen green lines, which were pump fakes. And again, I don't know if, if what we've seen is a pump fake or the start of a new cycle on the upside, but know that bear market rallies are quite normal in the context of a market decline. What I personally would like to see, and I, I posted last week, I believe about signs that we're looking for that could signal a bottom. And I, I laid out five or six and there's probably a dozen, but I, I just shared the ones that, that I like the most. But one thing that's very simple that I would like to see would be the a more normalization of intraday market moves. Like we're seeing these huge swings down one and a half percent in the morning, up 1% in the afternoon, up 1% in the morning, down one and a half percent at market close. That's not normal. A, a bull market is really boring. It's a, it's a series, a long series of dull up moves. Small up moves is basically what a bull market is. And these small up moves, you stack up day after day after day, and it equals a sizable move to the upside. So the intraday swings, that needs to go away for us to start a new cycle. And I don't think we're quite there yet. So again, those that follow uh, my commentary and Pierre's commentary know that we're a big fan of credit spreads, especially lower quality bonds, because they can signal market troughs and actually market peaks. It gives a, a sense of the risk appetite in the market. So let's just zoom in on this. So this is the last year, and this is just a, uh, an index of lower quality bonds. And when this line is moving up, that could signal stress in financial markets or in the economy and basically what this is showing it's an increase in borrowing costs for lower quality companies. So as this line goes up, that means companies cost of capital is going up, which if you're a marginal company and you're heavily indebted and you take a, a huge input cost to you interest expense and you increase it by almost double, that could be the end of your business. That could be the end of your business as a going concern. So what we're looking for here, is a peak in this number. Peaks in low quality bond spreads tend to signal market bottoms. So this could be a peak. We could have seen a bottom in, in June. 
as you see this is moving down if this if this spread moves back up then that would be a signal of potentially more pain ahead but again the next peak the cycle peak could signal a bottom for stocks zooming out so that was the last year so we looked at the last year this is this provides context of the same index of lower quality bonds we're going back to 1997 and you can see this red line here that's kind of the magic number when high yield spreads go above this that tends to coincide with recessions and market declines and of course the big one here is the financial crisis and you can see it here where spreads were extremely tight during the boom times of the middle 2000s and then when things got messy borrowing costs just exploded higher so this is an extreme outlier but it's it's good to make my point and then the s p ended up bottoming right around here and you can see close to this tip the s p bottom was right around here so what we're looking for again is the cycle peak here and again in 2020 spreads blew out again as we had the covid sell-off but if, if if we were to look at this summer of 2020 that marked the high yield spread peak that marked the market bottom so the question is is this the cycle peak and high yield credit spreads and could that potentially mean a bottom you will also know i'm a big fan of sentiment and sentiment the negative sentiment out there is probably the most bullish indicator that we track so what this is it's a it's a little bit different spin on what i've shown in the past this is the bull bear spread okay so i i like to work in the extremes so when when people feel horrible this spread is going to be negative right if if the bulls are one and the bears are a hundred that's going to be a very small number that's going to be a excuse me it's going to be a negative number so one minus a hundred there's a hundred bears and one bull one minus a hundred is negative 99 right so that's that's an extreme i'm just using that as an example but what this tracks is the consecutive weeks with a negative bull bear spread which again would indicate negative investor sentiment okay so we've had 16 straight weeks of negative investor sentiment and when you go back and look again this is really crazy to me how people feel worse now than the peak of the financial crisis all right and and you can see how scary COVID was to a lot of people where bears vastly outnumbered bulls so the pessimists vastly outnumbered the bulls and there was actually let's see 30 call it 33 consecutive weeks of negative investor sentiment right now we're at about half that 16 but people are feeling pretty bad if you were to draw a line over here people are feeling worse about the stock market excluding 2020 going back to 1990. so this is this is pretty unprecedented stuff and historically as we've shown future returns tend to be higher after these cycle peaks i don't know if this is the peak here again so you can kind of see what we're doing taking multiple bottoming indicators and trying to piece it together to tell a story but again th this is an odd time there's a lot of moving parts the market's going to act in a way to make the greatest number of people look stupid so that's why we don't make predictions one it's impossible two it's just a, a futile exercise so looking for the cycle peak here in bull bear spread and then conversely when you see the bulls outnumber the bears like here so this is a good example too when people are 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 euphoric and there's a hundred bulls and one bear that's an overwhelming overwhelmingly positive spread which you see in 1999 which again was followed by the tech crash in the middle 2000s this number was really low and then things started to get a little weird here but when people feel best it's usually not the time to seek risk or get more aggressive when people feel the worst it's oftentimes a good time to seek risk and get more aggressive unfortunately humans end up doing the opposite of what they should do when they feel great or when they feel bad okay so this is fed week by the time you see this the fed will have already made a decision it looks like they're going to hike 0.75 or three quarters of one percent I'd, I'd be shocked if they did something else but what this is this is market participants betting in the futures market so the, the these are investors betting with their own capital investors and speculators betting with their own capital trying to price what the fed is going to do and what this says is the fed funds rate the short-term interest rate in this country will be 3.5 percent by the end of the year or roughly two percent higher than it is today okay so there's a lot of people out there 
spewing that the Fed's going to do this, the Fed's going to do that. This is this is much better to pay attention to than a talking head. This is investors voting with their capital. So this can change. Like you can't set your watch to this, but I think it's important to take cues from the market and understand how investors are position are positioning themselves given what the Fed is rumored to be doing. Okay. And what's really interesting about this is this goes out to July, but there's also a, a futures curve for 2023 and beyond. And it's, it's quite a, a game actually. So the Fed is going to hike based on this to 3.5% at the end of the year in 2023, the market is pricing in the Fed cutting rates. So there's a camp out there that says the more aggressive the Fed is today. So let's say instead of 3.5%, the Fed hikes to 6%. People think that's a good thing because it means the Fed is going to be more aggressive cutting rates. And when interest rates are going down, that acts as a tailwind to the economy. It lowers, it lowers borrowing costs for businesses and consumers. It also tends to be a tailwind for, for stocks as investors can't generate a meaningful return in a safe asset class like CDs or U.S. Treasuries, right? If rates go down, that's less attractive. Buying a, a speculative stock with low borrowing costs uh, might, might be more attractive. So it's, it's kind of a risk on risk off equation, but it's interesting to me that all the talk is about the Fed increasing rates. On the other side, in 2023, the market's saying, hey, if the Fed increases rates, they're probably going to end up cutting more aggressively. This is interesting. So the Fed talks a lot. They've got their board of governors. You've got a chairman Powell who holds a press conference every month. And this actually tracks how dovish or hawkish the Fed is. And hawkish means there's a bias to increase rates. Dovish means there's a bias to cut rates. So you can see this when inflation was rearing its ugly head here in the latter months of 2021. In early 2022, this line basically, I mean, it's choppy, but it basically goes straight up. If you were to draw a linear line through this right here, it would be straight up. The Fed was, was getting hawkish, meaning they were going to get tough on inflation and raise rates to, to stomp it out. That's really retracted. So the Fed, certain Fed governors have really taken their foot off the gas and become more measured in their comments. It's not pound the table, we're going to raise rates and have blinders on. It's... We might be biased towards rates going up, but we're open if economic data changes. And it certainly is changing. There's a lot of people right now that are very confused because as we're going to see as we go forward in this, there's recessionary lights flashing. The recessionary winds are blowing and it's very uncommon for the Fed to be raising rates when the data is softening like it is. Usually when economic conditions are getting softer, which they are, the Fed would be cutting rates trying to foster a softer landing. There's all this talk about a hard landing and a soft landing. I would argue, and I've done this in the past, that we've already had a pretty hard landing. I mean, this has been the greatest destruction of wealth in modern history, where you know, you've seen trillions wiped out of the equity market, trillions wiped out of the bond market, trillions wiped out of the crypto market. So it's, it's, been, a rough, it's been a rough go for people. So I don't understand this soft versus hard landing. It's already been a hard landing. So now we're gonna get into some of the flashing yellow, flashing red signs on the economic front. So this is the Atlanta Fed's GDP now estimate, and it takes data in real time. It takes economic data in real time and tries to project what GDP will be for the coming quarter. And as you can see, this green line has basically fallen off a cliff. We had negative GDP in the first quarter. It looks like based on the numbers, we could have negative GDP in the second quarter, which some people say would be the official definition of a recession. You know, the White House is out there saying that that's not the definition of a recession. There's another another, another government entity that has a, di a, a different definition of a recession. So no matter how you slice it, whatever you want to call it, there's no denying the economic data is starting to roll over. And if you caught my previous post, I, I did this a couple weeks ago, people get hung up on the recession versus not a recession, forecasting a recession. You know, a recession is not some switch that you flip and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're in a recession. It's basically consumers like you and I, investors like you and I, changing our tolerance for risk. So instead of seeking risk, we're all going to hunker down. 
And part of that, part of that risk seeking behavior is how people feel. And this is a misery index tracking inflation and unemployment. And it's starting to tick higher. You can see it's really spiked up during the COVID sell off, but it's starting to tick higher as inflation ticks higher, unemployment starting to get a little softer. So this is where businesses and consumers start to retrench and change their behavior, which is basically the definition of a recession. Investors, consumers changing their behavior. A lot of hot talk on yield curve inversions. Historically, this goes back to 1970, these dark blue columns that creep higher indicate the percentage of points on a yield curve that are inverted. So when this blue line, these blue columns are high, that basically means the entire yield curve is inverted, which means short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. So the yield curve slopes like this downward in a normal healthy economy, the yield curve would be upward sloping. Okay. So people see a yield curve inversion and they say, okay, a, a recession is coming. That's not necessarily the case. I mean, it could be the case, but what, what we're looking for is more points on a yield curve that are inverted, increase the likelihood of a recession. So these recessions are grayed out here. And you can see, I mean, you can almost set your watch to this as a greater percentage of the yield curve gets inverted, a recession follows, which again is the gray line, right? So 2000, 2007 to 2009, 2020, and we are starting to see more points on the yield curve invert, which is not a good sign. And drilling down, you can see what this looks like. So the previous chart was as of 1970, this is the calendar year of 2022. And you can see as we move through the months, the number of points on the curve that are getting inverted are going up, which is not a good sign. Index of leading indicators, streaks of monthly decline since 1960. So again, a lot of economists track leading indicators. So not, so some, some economic data, economic data leaks out at different points during the month. And what we're trying to reconcile here is all of the data points that are coming in in real time, we're trying to estimate our the trend of leading indicators going up or going down. Okay. If they're going negative, that's a bad sign. And more and more of these indicators are becoming negative. So what this is tracking is the amount of indicators that are, are going negative and, and trying to establish a trend. And you can see again, as leading indicators get to negative territory on monthly declines, as, as we see consecutive months of declines in leading of leading indicators, the more likelihood of a recession. Okay. So we're kind of touching on the danger zone here of almost five months straight of monthly declines for economic data. Now you can see some of these extremes, which basically signal a recession is either happening or about to happen. And we're not close yet. I mean, we, we are close, but it's not a for, foregone conclusion, like some of these other dramatic spikes. Okay. So if this number is 10 or 15 straight months, a poor economic data that would signal a recession is either here or most likely going to come. So you'll notice a lot of these, a lot of these flashing lights are yellow. They're not quite red, although you can argue some are maybe becoming red and just like trying to time a market bottom, we're trying to piece all these things together to create a narrative, to create a story based on what's happening in real time. It sounds simple, but it's really not. Okay. The 10 year treasury yield. So this is something we watch very, very closely. This might be my favorite metric to watch. And in general, when this yield, so this is yield here, and this is since the middle of last year to July of 2022, the 10 year treasury yield, when this yield goes down, that's a sign that investors are seeking shelter. They're seeking safety and soundness. Uh, they could be worried about growth. They could be worried about the economy. It could be just looking for a place, a safe place to park their money because they're scared of taking risk and dramatic drops in the 10 year yield are a risk off sign. Some consider that a warning sign. You know, I always mention this, but before the COVID sell off hit the 10 year treasury yield cratered, you know, it went from like two point something down to sub 1% and it did it in a very quick fashion. It happened in like a week. And it was a, it was a dramatic sign to take risk off. And this isn't as dramatic of a move, but this certainly has our attention. So going from 3.5% yield down to 
sub 3% in a relatively short amount of time and basically a month and a half, that is, that could be a canary in a coal mine for, for further pain, or at least a slowdown in economic growth. And this, this graph just provides greater context to, to the previous index of the leading of leading indicators, which could signal a recession. So again, this has basically fallen off a cliff from 2020 until now signaling the economic data is rolling over a bit. And you can see as this line goes negative, recessions tend to follow with the exception of 1996, 2000 is cratered, 2007, 2008 is cratered, 1980s, mid seventies. So these are all pretty good signs of a recession about to come. And again, this is like right on the bubble. This is not saying a recession is imminent. This is not saying that we're out of the woods. Jobless claims. So one of the, one of the areas that more optimistic people have pointed to is that jobless claims are hanging in there nicely. So people are keeping their jobs. There's plenty of jobs to go around. Companies aren't laying people off. That is starting to change. So what we've done here is tracking jobless claims. So as this number goes up, that means the more people are filing uh, for unemployment benefits, they've lost their jobs. And this light blue line is where we're at now over the last 12 months. And this darker blue line is where we were in 2008. So 12 months before January, 2008. So actually January of 2007 to December of 2007. And you can see on the doorstep to the great financial crisis, the year before, jobless claims really trended higher. So in the spring of 2007, that marked the trough. These really raced higher, signaling the economy was in trouble. Okay, and you can see that that hasn't been a problem for the, for the better part of the year. Now, over the last couple of months, jobless claims are starting to tick higher and you're seeing it. Not only companies laying off workers, but they're freezing hiring. I mean, this has happened at the biggest companies, Facebook, Apple, Google, all of these companies are pumping the brakes on hiring or laying off workers. Not a good sign. Back to my comments about changing behaviors. So again, a recession is not a light a switch that you flip, but it's changing behaviors. And this is trying to capture companies, capital expenditures. So this is the manufacturing sector. There are capital spending plans from 2001 to 2022. And again, th there's some outliers here. And I like to look at extremes to make a point. This fell off a cliff in 2008 and 2009. It's starting to fall off a cliff now. So companies are really tightening the purse strings saying, we don't really understand the economic landscape. It looks like demand is slowing down. We are going to pump the brakes on spending and see what happens. Same thing happened in 2020. Right now we're at the lowest level since 2020. And this is not just happening in the manufacturing sector. It's happening in, this is supposed to be technology, but for the technology sector, and you can see Fell off a cliff in 2008, 2009, fell off a cliff in 2020, it's falling off a cliff now. So manufacturing, technology spending plans are all retracing and companies are tightening the purse strings. Not a good sign. Housing. Housing is an odd cocktail because it's not a centralized market. I've said this before, what's true in the Southwest is not true in New York. It's a fragmented market, but higher interest rates double the mortgage payment are signaling or could, could lead to a slowdown and it's starting to happen. So for, for Purist clients, I sent out in our chart of the week last week, Redfin is seeing more price cuts than they have in like 10 years or eight years or something like that. So the housing market is certainly softening and it, there's, there's people that say the housing market is the market cycle. And, it, and if you think about it, a lot of Americans biggest asset on their balance sheet is their home. So, so this is a big deal. So you're seeing this, this housing market index, which is a, a basket of various inputs. And this is, this is actually capturing builder sentiment. So this survey is a, a direct reflection of builders who are in it every single day and they're not feeling very good. So when people that are in the business are not feeling very good, that potentially could be a sign of trouble. And you can see again, back in the nineties, uh, when this index goes down, often coincides with the recession, uh, same thing in the early 2000s, 2008, and it's starting to show cracks now. So this is a big week. And again, we are going to be posting this and most of you will be watching this either Thursday or Sunday, 
and we're getting a boatload of earnings. So we're getting a barrage of earnings this week, which are very interesting because they're, they're reflective of the broader economy. You have various sectors and industries that are represented. And while there is some fluff, it's a, it's a really good, it's a really good barometer for what businesses are seeing and feeling. So there's a lot of earnings being reported this week and next week, and some of the biggest companies are reporting right here this week. So the big four technology firms are reporting, and the majority of the S&P is going to be reporting over the next two weeks. So this, this is actually a, a big thing. You know, I mean, earnings happen four times a year, so it's not, a, uh, it's not like a rare event or anything like that. But there's a lot of people that say this could be the most important earnings of the year because it could influence the Fed. If C-suite executives, CEOs, and CFOs come out and say earnings were pretty good or were able to withstand some of the slowdown in demand, if they raise forward guidance, that could embolden the Fed to either get more aggressive or if, if the C-suite executives say the opposite, say things are softening, they're lowering guidance, the Fed could pump the brakes and not raise rates as much as the market forecasts or as much as they, the Fed projects. So it's not just earnings that we're going to be watching here. It's what CEOs and CFOs are saying. That's, that's where the gold is, is in the footnotes. So a couple of videos ago, it might've been last video. One of the things that we were looking for was a natural ebbing of inflation. And, you know, the Fed talks a lot about inflation, but there are certain things that they just can't, in, at least not directly. And one of those is commodity prices and oil and gas prices. So this chart shows the journey of a price of gasoline on average for 2022 versus kind of the normal glide path for a year since 2005. So it, it's natural for gas prices to go up in the summer as kids are out of school and families are traveling. This is not normal. This is a, a mess of a graph, but this gives the Fed some wiggle room to maybe have options and not necessarily blindly go ahead with their rate increases. If there's a natural ebbing of inflation, if inflation starts to subside, the Fed could back off the gas pedal and ease or lower their, their current glide path for increasing rates. So this is a good sign. You know, I've been following this quite a bit and it looks like gasoline across the country is sub $5, which is still high, obviously, but it's provided consumers a little bit of a break at the pump, which is a good thing. All right, so that's it. Uh, we kind of bounced around more than I usually would, but there's just a lot going on, a lot of data points. Again, this is not a, a projection or a, a prediction that we're about to embark on a recession. I'm not calling a bottom. I'm just trying to give you insight into the things that we look at and the market metrics that we track that, that could potentially allow us to put the pieces together and craft a narrative. People ask me all the time what my forecast is for the market. And I think the best way to answer that question is to look how we're positioned. Pure Portfolio's clients have been underweight equities across the board for almost the entire year. So that's basically what we think about what is happening. And, and that certainly helped our clients mitigate downside risk. Of course, the counter to that is, is by being underweight equities, we've been overweight fixed income. Fixed income is down as well, but it's not nearly down as much as the broader equity markets which has helped, again, soften downside risk. What I do like about our positioning is bonds have started to behave much better lately as yields have come down. So the Fed can control the short end of the yield curve by increasing or cutting rates. The longer end of the yield curve is determined by inflation, inflation expectations, and growth. If investors think the economy is falling off a cliff, you would expect longer term yields to go down, which they have. That's where we're getting these inversions. The long end of the curve is going down. The short end of the curve is going up, which overall has helped our positioning. Bonds are starting to act a little better than they have. That's a good thing because one of the maddening things about 2022, especially the first half, was bonds and stocks going down together. That rarely happens, but it does happen. And it doesn't feel very good when every asset class that you own is going down in value. So encourage that bonds are acting a little bit better. One of the knocks on bonds in the last 10 years or so is they haven't, they haven't provided any yield. That's starting to change. And there is pockets of value in the fixed income market. There's, there's some professional investors that think bonds are a screaming buy. I'm certainly not in that camp, 
but bonds are certainly more attractive than they've been over the past decade. So let us know if you have any feedback. Let us know if you have any thoughts or questions. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.